Good morning, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, my name is Jackie Lewis. I'm the content director here at the CMA and I'm gonna be your host for today's webinar. I am thrilled to be introducing Wiser and Sabra Dipping who are gonna be walking us through how they've improved brand performance with e-commerce business intelligence. So Wiser provides businesses the tools necessary to act both online and offline. Working with Wiser, customers gain access to millions of websites globally, hundreds of thousands of in-store shoppers, and Wiser's near real-time intelligence for multi-channel visibility. Wiser customers can expand visibility, increase revenues, and drive growth with their entire suite of in-store and online tools. And so from Wiser, we have Tom Lee, uh, Director of Product, who comes to us with 14 plus years of experience at companies including Apple and Walmart, leveraging creativity, cross-functional business experience, a technical background, and leadership skills. So welcome, Tom. You wanna to give a quick quick wave? <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, Sabra Dipping Company is a leader in the refrigerated dips and spreads category and producer of America's top-selling hummus. Sabra's award-winning products offer consumers fresh new ways of eating and connecting and include a variety of flavors of both hummus and guacamole. So from Sabra, we have Mert Damla Panar, Director of E-Commerce. And Mert is also an expert in digital marketing and analytics and will be drawing on his decades of experience in the space to speak on the customer journey today. So if you have any questions for Tom or Mert throughout the webinar, feel free to enter those in the chat box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And we're gonna ask those at the end as time <clears throat> allows. Uh, we'll also be recording the presentation today, so don't worry if you miss something. We'll be sending uh, both the recording out to all those that registered, and then we're also going to post in the CMA SEMA resource library early next week. So with all of that out of the way, welcome again to Tom and Mertz, and I will let you take the floor. Sounds good. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, CMA, for having us here today. Uh, as Jackie mentioned, my name is Tom Lee, and I am the head of our online products here at Wiser. One thing I do want to uh, clear out right away, um, in case you're wondering whether I'm the same person as the person in the picture, I assure you that I am. Uh, I just have pandemic hair going on and I haven't cut my hair for, for a year and a half. So at some point, I'll go back to that look again. Uh, super excited to be here and very excited to have Mert uh, here with us. Um, I'm going to present a couple slides today on the market. Uh, Mert is going to talk a lot more about his experience helping uh, e-commerce businesses uh, uh, grow and optimize. So with that, let me kind of kick right into a couple marketing slides. If we were together in person, I think I would probably take a poll and, and ask you guys, have, it, like, have any of you uh, shop for groceries online in the past year? And I would also wonder how many of you would be surprised if I say that right now in 2021, over 50% of Americans have shopped for groceries online at least one time. That is a tremendous amount of growth in, the, in just the past few years. E-commerce, as you guys know, has been growing substantially for over a decade now. For online groceries, I would say it really started sometime around 2015, 2016, uh, when it really started to take hold and, and, and grow uh, tremendously. I think when the pandemic hit last year, uh, what happened was it really helped to accelerate uh, this transition uh, and the adoption of shopping for groceries online. Uh, it's just super convenient and much safer to be able to buy your favorite um, produce, deli meats, obviously hummus, uh, right in the comfort of your, home, of your own home. But I would also point out that this, this uptick, I think is here to stay. I don't think it's a temporary thing because once, once consumers and customers get used to the convenience and start relying on online shopping, just like for, for other, other things in e-commerce, It'll, it'll be part of their experience. And I really think this is a, 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 a start in the trend towards omnichannel, as, as we talked about um, before. So, the, so the, the major platforms that we've uh, seen, obviously, is growing a lot. Um, 
Amazon Fresh, you're probably very familiar with, Walmart Groceries, Instacart, which delivers for multiple retailers, and others also coming online. Now, online groceries is not just limited to delivering. A lot of supermarkets and grocery stores are now offering order online and pick up in store. Another thing that I do want to note is even though I'm, I'm, I'm talking about online grocery right now, I think a lot of the trends that, that, you, that, that I'm talking about right now and that I will be talking about applies more broadly across e-commerce. The next topic I want to quickly touch on um, is the customer segmentation. About half of online grocery shoppers are millennials. I think that's probably not too surprising to most people. Millennials are very tech savvy. They are definitely early adapters and they highly value convenience. At the same time, when you look at the Gen X adoption rate, it's also really, it's also pretty drastic. They're really making a big transition from solely brick and mortar shopping for, for groceries to a combined omni-channel experience. And something else to add here is that when you compare Gen X to even millennials, their average spending power is still higher. So this is a segment that is very important to, to a lot of brands, to a lot, to a lot of retailers, and it's important to target them specifically. What you don't see in this pie chart on the left-hand side are the Gen Zs. But I won't forget it, I, I would not ignore them because as they come of age and as their spending power increases, they're gonna be a very big part of the um, online grocery shop, shopping uh, segmentation. And Gen Zers are very much like millennials, but they grew up around e-commerce and the way they shop is even more uh, geared towards online. Mert is gonna talk a little bit more about this, but I think it's very important for brands to build awareness for their company, for their business with the right touch points. And Mert's gonna talk about what that actually means. The way you reach millennials or the way you reach Gen Zers is in many ways different sometimes, uh, than how you would reach baby boomers and Gen X. So I spend a lot of time talking to brands, talking to manufacturers, talking to retailers, working with my customers, working with prospects. I, I'm, I'm also very passionate about this space, so I do a lot of research as well. And what I often hear as being the most important aspects for consumers, for shoppers, boils down to competitive pricing, having the ability to choose from a broad selection of products, very good product content on websites to help them make the right decision and convenience, convenience of shopping. Obviously this has implications and considerations for, for brands and retailers alike. Brands and retailers need to have a very strong sense as to what their pricing strategies are, how do they wanna position themselves, and to do so, obviously you need to have the intelligence, the pricing intelligence, to make the right decision. In today's environment, it is super easy for a consumer to just, through a couple of clicks, find many different offerings, different listings, and, com and compare prices throughout the, throughout the internet. So having the insights is super important. For product selection, it is easier than ever for a consumer to compare multiple products to choose the best one for them, that is, that is right for them. Product placement is super important. And this, this means both um, in brick and mortar stores and also in your digital shelf. What are your products being positioned next to is another consideration. In the product content, what you show on your website, how you describe your product, is very important as well. So I think what this, what this all comes down to is, I think there are a lot of opportunities for brands and retailers right now in 2021. 
as more and more consumers shop online, and you combine that with just a lot more channels to for for consumers to shop, these two things together really creates a lot more data for brands and retailers. And I think companies who really uh, who really adapt this and really have a good strategy to utilize this data and to take decisive action on it could really build a competitive advantage uh, today. So right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it over to Mert and Mert is gonna give uh, some, more, some more of his opinions and takes on how to optimize for your e-commerce business. Mert? Sure. Thank you, Jackie and the CMA for having us here today and thank you, Tom and the Wiser team. So let's go over in a more integrated sales and marketing environment with a digital approach. Let's go over how we look at our objectives. Let's go over how we implement and execute on them and how we build reporting and measurement capabilities. So I'm gonna go over some slides real quick with the support of Tom and we'll talk about them in the Q&A session at the end, hopefully. Next slide, please. Yes. So during a typical marketing strategy planning up until this point, we usually consider some frameworks like the four P's and the STP's where we can segment and target different audiences and different customer profiles. And today I want to talk about two other analytical tools that play a crucial role for the execution and the measurement. The customer funnel on the left side and the customer journey on the right side. So we're going to talk about how these tools enable you to gain a deep understanding of your customers and develop strategies that fit their needs and advance your business as well. So I'm going to share some insights about how I apply them to my own daily work for managing e-commerce channels in a CPG vertical, specifically in food and beverage. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the customer funnel. And so this is a very useful tool in understanding where the customers are and whom our customer is and what stages in the purchase decision may they be and at any given state and any given time period. So this is also called the purchase funnel or sales funnel. You might hear some different names depending on the time and the terminology, but the basic idea is to really allow you think about getting in the mind of the consumer to see at what points in time they may be in. And we have a very simple four stage funnel here on the slide. These are the most common stages for the products and that are out there. The important thing to keep in mind is that the reason why the customer funnel is important is because it allows you to map something called the customer journey later on, we're gonna talk about in a second. And also it allows you to help identify what your company is currently good at doing, at which state that a customer may be in, and help you understand what are some things that your company could perhaps improve upon as the customers are moving through different stages of the funnel. And the four stages of the customer funnel we have here help you evaluate where your current marketing efforts are succeeding or failing so you can plot appropriate marketing activities accordingly. And let's also think about how technology has changed this concept of a traditional funnel, what you'll also encounter and face What's more current view of the funnel nowadays is this idea of loyalty loop or retargeting pool. So instead of a top-down whittling down smaller and smaller group of people in this purchase funnel we're talking about, there could be this idea of people going through a loop. And if we can target on this pool and loop, it could benefit us and it can enhance our performance. And the concept of a loyalty loop that you will see out there is that that's simply the idea of a funnel. They're all interconnected very, very heavily and but once people have purchased your product they can also come back and think about considering your product again and purchase again and then perhaps navigating for you to other customers and to re really loop in that worth of mouth phenomena and therefore you're going to have your advertising capabilities multiply and so there are variations to the basic same concept and the key point to take away here is not whether how many stages of the funnel there are or the labels that are on the funnel whether it's a loop or it's a tunnel, but the important thing is, I think it's a traceable way. If we think about the different mindset that your customers may be going through, and then once you have what the mindsets would be, that gives you a more concrete way to deploy your marketing strategies as well as later to optimize them upon. And so this is the most important thing to take away from the customer funnel, in my opinion. Capability to identify creating those loops and cycles and then capitalize on them for further enhancement and performance. 
Great. Hey, Mart, as you mentioned, the technology is changing very fast and the right. industry is also changing very fast right now. From your perspective, right, um, what are some of these big trends that you've seen and how has that changed the way you manage your e-commerce your e-commerce channel? For example, how has the pandemic changed the way you do things or the shift uh, from brick and mortar to online? Great. The short answer to that in general, most if not all CPG brands like, like us, we started tracking digital shelf metrics and the shopper behavior through their online journey more closely because of this technological advancements and funnel visibility and the granularity of the reporting we have improved significantly in the last three, four years. And it's also benefiting the shopper to have a seamless shopping experience in this omni-channel environment brands and retailers are creating for them on a shorter path to purchase. So it's easier to find products and convenience, more assortment options, and easier to complete the purchase. So similar to how companies like Uber Eats and Postmates change the delivery landscape, so too is e-commerce reshaping grocery platforms. And a recent study of Mercado showed that 90% of the grocery customers are expected to continue shopping online, post-COVID even. So this kind of capability of reporting will be crucial for brands like us to map out the customer journey, identify digital touch points, lay out the customer behavior and develop our marketing strategies according to that. And the more tools and technical avail tactics are available on these platforms, we're gonna shift our ad dollars to those activities that bring success to us. Gotcha, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next slide please. So this is the customer journey. The customer journey gives us a snapshot of a typical sequence of specific activities that customers take as they move through the broad stages of their journey or this customer funnel as we talked about in the previous slide. Now to understand the customer journey, it's important to highlight the difference between the funnel and the journey. The, the difference between them is that the journey really takes the analogy of understanding getting into the minds of the customers to a whole new level. And the whole idea of the customer journey is really you want to take it from customer's perspective and see just from the very first moment of awareness, the first time see one of your ads, and what are the different touch points that they will use and perhaps interact with your brand all the way through the point of purchase and even perhaps repeat purchase in the retention stage. And that's the primary difference between the funnel and the journey. The perspective and then the digital touch points we can map and track. The customer funnel also allows us to map out these different stages and if you don't map it out you don't even know which part of the funnel those people are leaking out and where you're losing them. And then the customer journey itself is the whole picture of this idea, holistic view of this idea. It really helps us to understand what is the experience that the customer is going through as they become acquainted in purchasing our product. And the key thing here to point out is that the customer journey is not necessarily sequential. They may actually jump through different parts of the funnel and maybe repeat certain parts of the funnel. And that's another useful distinction between the funnel and journey. And the technology changes later on. This will be more and more important. And hopefully we'll be able to talk about it in the coming slides. So let's talk about how the technology may change all that. Since a customer may potentially jump back and forth between these different touch points, it's possible that in any one of those points researching about other products as well so they might be always looking at competition or even different categories and technology just really changes and facilitates that interaction in a more two-way process right another thing that has changed due to technology is this idea of paid own and earned media different placements across multiple platforms retargeting pixels engagement instances and with a myriad of reporting and optimization platforms available today we can monitor and report number of KPIs to measure the performance of our marketing investment behind all of these programs and activations. You can see some of the key KPIs on the slide at the bottom part. And depending on your organization, depending on your vertical, depending on your product, KPIs might differ slightly. But the idea is to be able to map out stages, get as many as digital touch points under our reporting capabilities and start measuring them and shift our ad dollars to the ones that are performing better. And what this allows us to do is that it allows us to allocate budget and attention to certain channels, 
different types of activations and different placements. And it also gives us a very tractable way of how to think about testing and reiterating our digital marketing strategy across all these different touch points. And that's the most important thing about the mapping out the customer journey. Gotcha. Um, hey, Mert, um, as you talk about the customer journey, it really makes me think about the customer experience altogether. Obvi obviously, Sabra is a very successful brand, a very great reputation. Uh, your products are sold at many retailer locations, both in brick and mortar and also online. How does Sabra maintain a consistent customer experience across all of the different websites and all the different retail locations? I would say, I mean, not only my opinion, in general, agreement in the marketing ecosystem that we're playing in, product content drives sales, both in store and online. And when we take the product content seriously, we sell dramatically more in both brick and click and all the other omnichannel platforms. Having an active product content strategy across all retailers, as well as our own website, if you have any DTC capability, is essential to winning the today's consumer first marketplace. But it's not enough to take the basic PIMDAM or product information management, digital asset management data that fuels in-store planograms and merchandising programs. We're working really hard to make sure our content works in the way shoppers do, integrated interactively across mobile, desktop, TV, tablet, whatever media they consume or whatever pl platform they choose to consume their media or content, and also into the physical store where available. And we're using a PXM platform, product experience management platform, where we can optimize our content and syndicate to multiple retailers, monitor our content health score, and store all our content copy and creative assets, and one location for a centralized PIM dam execution. So that helps us to enhance our content across multiple channels and create the omni-channel easy to shop experience for the consumer. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Landscape changing fast. We're just trying to adapt, honestly. Exactly. <laughs> so on this slide, we're talking about a blueprint. And again, this is just a template. You can find many similar templates out there. You can even come up with your O's. But once you've mapped out the actions your customer take in a typical journey from awareness all the way to the retention, then you can reflect on difficult spots and the places where customers may lose interest. You can identify customer activity and goals, narrow down your business goals, select certain KPIs to track, and you list the technology platforms you need to utilize on different stages of the journey. And another reason why you want to map out the customer journey and come up with a blueprint is for you to identify the missed opportunities in the journey, right? Because you have leakage, you're losing customers at different digital touch points, different transition moments in the funnel. So where are those holes in the journey and where are the most of the people dropping off at what percentages? What are the organizational weaknesses we have to track our funnel performance and what are the roles and responsibilities between different teams in the organization? Because it's more and more cohesive sales, marketing, supply chain at some point, what products and platforms do we need to track for executive execution and reporting? So for instance, if you were to map out a customer journey and without doing any change to your digital marketing or marketing campaign, you really you're gonna realize that you're doing a great job at getting people at the awareness stage, but your real problem might be actually closing the sale. So that will change on how you do digital marketing if your problem is actually at the awareness level or at the closure or conversion level. So supposedly you're a CPG company and you have a great awareness amongst an older segment of the population to Tom's earlier point in the opening of the webinar. And you wanna target a younger segment of the population. So you wanna shift your focus and you wanna target a new segment in your audience. You find a new opportunity in the market. So what are the platforms that they're spending their time on? Where is their attention? If they're spending most of their time on social media or on their apps and mobile phones, then perhaps if you identify that this is the weakness in your customer journey, you will want to spend a ton of resources on those associated apps and custom channels to be able to speak and reach out to those new segments you're targeting more authentically and more effectively, honestly. And so that's one of the main reasons why you wanna map out the customer's journey 
so you can understand where can you improve your customer performance experience and also your digital marketing strategy. All this blueprints, customer journey maps will help you to get there. Great. A question that I have is in the considerations phase. As I mentioned in, in my previous slides, these days it is super easy for consumers to compare different product offerings. For me, this makes product placement on the digital shelf, product content, availability, rating, feedback, and even pricing, super, super important, right? right. What levers does Sabra use to increase engagement and also to increase uh, the add to cart during this consideration space? Yes, that's really essential. And that's a hot topic we've been talking about in the recent months. And the answer to that is we use a PXM platform where we have also digital shelf metrics, reporting capabilities, managing our product and shopping experience. And then where we have visibility into what products have the largest share of the results for given search terms or shelf pages and identify if the products are organic or sponsored. We can also track online in stock availability, get a snapshot of pricing trends, pricing changes or promotions, activity for a specific product assortment across key retailers to show volatility or irregularity, or even competitive pricing situations over different periods of time. And this helps us a lot. This gives us a lot of information and this gives us a lot of opportunity to take action for some of the campaigns, even in flight. And in addition to that, our shopper marketing and media teams have been deploying an omnichannel approach where we can create more digital touch points to make it easier for shoppers to add their favorite product into their cart or complete a purchase immediately compared to the less traditional sites you would expect. So we're looking for different mediums and different opportunities where we can lay out those digital touch points to make the path shorter for the consumer, as well as retailer side, of course, all the big box retailer websites. So influencers, referrals, ratings and reviews on product detail pages, shoppable media in the consumer social media feeds or any kind of website, kind of other different mediums they spend their time on block pages help us to increase engagement and also increase the add-to-cart rates. That's one of the two metrics we're tracking. Engagement level of our content, the right content to reach the right segment, and what kind of actions those this content helps them to take. What, what I hear a lot of times is that this is, this is as much about art as it is about science. There isn't a, a you know, one equation that fits all here. That's right. It's a nice blend and we don't have the right proportion metrics yet. We don't know what the percentage is. It's shifting constantly. That's right. And let's look at some attributions on the slide. Yes. So on this slide, we're going to be talking about what's the full attribution picture looks like and how we can build it, how we can track it. Then before we develop a detailed digital marketing plan, we usually begin considering how we're going to determine if our marketing campaign is a success. So since any marketing campaign and other digital activations nowadays uh, include technology, involves technology, there is no shortage of data for us to analyze when evaluating the performance of a digital marketing campaign we launch. But how do we decide where to focus our attention? And one of the great promises of all those digital marketing platforms out there is the ability to track metrics and have very fine grain data on our customers. So, well, not so fast, honestly, on our team at least. It's common to hear people saying that we will be able to have all this big data on our customers. So this will lead to new magical insights. What people usually don't talk about enough is that while metrics are very important, yes, and to Tom's point, data is very important, it's very easy to fall into a trap where you can have a bunch of data and it can be very overwhelming and misleading. So we might be overwhelmed with all kinds of different metrics that we may have, and we're able to track about our customers without really getting any new insights, actually. So we can track number of impressions of a digital banner ad, the number of page views, the number of tweets, the number of likes, click-through rates, active users per day, so on and so forth. But it can be very overwhelming with a ton of metrics. And the trap here is that we have the long list of metrics we can track 
with a list of data, but in reality, we might not really know that much about our customers and their shopping behavior. So that's why it's important to understand where we have full attribution, where we have incomplete attribution, what factors play into that, and how I can identify and resolve these issues down the road within our funnel. And in the next slide, we're gonna be looking at what the incomplete attribution looks like. So the problem with tracking that data though, is that if that's all we track, if we're only tracking data, anybody will be able to tell you that the problem with this metric is that it doesn't tell you the number of customers who ends up ordering and buying our products. So if our main goal from a campaign, I usually break it down in very, very simply in a two major buckets, awareness and reach and mostly sales conversion. Considerations happen somewhere in between, but it's playing into both buckets. In a very simplistic terms, I look at awareness, reach, and sales conversion. So if our goal, if our ROI at the end of the day really depends on what customer order behavior looks like, and we only optimize on the number of impressions per day, then we could be fooling ourselves into thinking that as long as we increase the number of impressions per day, we're going to increase the number of purchases because it should follow the logic, it should follow the sequence, right? Now that may be true, there may be a positive correlation between the number of people, let's see our digital banner ads and the number of purchases that we have, but that doesn't tell the full story in reality. It's important to know exactly what the relationship between the number of people that see our digital banner ad and also the number of people that orders. Is it out of every 100 people that see it? Is it 20 people that purchase it? Is it 10? So in any time span, daily or over a week, what's the attribution window? What's the average order? So it's important to ask these questions to map out that relationship. It's important to understand where the leakages are and where we lose the attribution between the first time a consumer sees our ad until the end of the purchase. So that's full or incomplete attribution map alongside the customer journey helps us to close those gaps and identify the opportunity where we can have better conversion success and better measurement success. How has the completeness of attributions improved the customer funnel for you? Uh, what can you do now that you previously could not do? It's a work in progress, but in general unlike the lower funnel attribution where we can track only conversion units or sales full funnel attribution incorporates impressions and assisted clicks in a conversion so we can go all the way back when the journey starts for a consumer just like <clears throat> excuse me just like on the slide here it looks at the full path to conversion and does not just focus on the last touch point click for example, in this case. With the full funnel attribution, we're able to identify a media tactic that may not have delivered a high volume of direct click conversions, but delivered a measurable impact on our branding message, engagement with the consumer, and also sales during the purchase consideration stage, whether they're just adding it to their cart, leaving it in their basket, or completing the purchase. So, for example, we use paid search and display for a campaign. And then looking at the full path to conversion, the last media channel the consumer interacted with before converting or completing the purchase could be a paid search. However, that consumer has also seen a display banner prior to the search query. So therefore, while our paid search effort and product placements gets the majority of the credit for the conversion, let's say 60%, 70%, display banner ad will also get partial credit for asserting the conversion and assisting it. And we'll make sure to deploy the two-prong approach between display banner ad and the paid search to increase the mid-funnel activation and also the conversion while we generate more attributed sales. So more than one tactic, two or more prongs running together will always enhance the performance as long as it's connected correctly according to the shopper journey and the behavior patterns we detect on the shopper journey. That's great. Right, on this slide, we're looking at the metrics. So yeah, we're putting all these digital touch points on the journey, we're increasing engagement, we're in improving our content and we're reporting them. So, okay, what are the metrics? What are the metrics that we can use? And I share most common Amazon advertising platform metrics we use on a slide. And the answer to that question really depends on the type of business and the vertical you're operating in. And But at the end of the day, what you really care about as a marketer 
or e-commerce specialist is how much can you spend on advertising to acquire each one of those customers and that leads to the first metric i want to tell you about about which is cost per acquisition cpa right sometimes refer as the cost of acquiring customer cac or cac but it's a very simple metric it's a very simple ratio and it's the amount of money that you're spending on advertising over the number of customers that you've acquired and this gives a sense of how much money you're spending to acquire each customer. And related to that metric is this idea of the customer lifetime value, of course, which stands for the amount of money that we're bringing in per customer over the course of their lifetime, as long as you shop our products. And what is my CPA or CAC? And what is my customer lifetime value or CLV? And usually in general, as a rule of thumb, you wanna keep the customer lifetime value to CAC ratio three to one or higher. So you don't have this metric on the slide, but all the other related metrics you can use, there is a ton of other metrics that you can use on a daily basis, day to day, help you guide on your understanding. That's what I put on the slide here. And your marketing campaigns, what channels should you use and which channels are more effective? Because those metrics will be dependent on the platforms and reporting capabilities of those platforms you will receive. CAC and CLV usually have to calculate yourself manually. So. As to other examples, such as conversion rates, click-through rates, cost per click, you see on the slide, these are all different variations to give us a sense of how effective each one of these advertising channels are for us. And depending on the type of advertising we run, whether it's through display banner ads, search, or through video, there are variations of these metrics as well. And the percentages will vary. So such, for instance, cost per impression, cost per click, or cost per view if our ad is a video. And terminology might slightly change, but the concept is the same. You gotta identify certain KPI, certain metrics for each digital touch point at the different stages of your funnel. And we're trying to find those platforms and products where we have more granular data, more visibility to those metrics, where we can track and report on them accurately. Are there any other metrics that have emerged with other marketplaces like Walmart or through grocery delivery services? How do you collect data on buy online and pick up in store? Yeah, this is one of the areas that we're challenged, honestly, because obviously there are two major data providers out there, Nielsen and IRI, but e-commerce data is still in its infancy. And even the market leaders, data providers, don't provide granular data similar to what they offer for brick and mortar retailers, which has been matured over the time, maybe in the last six, seven decades, maybe even longer. But as of today, we're able to monitor and measure all those metrics I shared on the slide, but it's not an easy task because we're using very fragmented data from multiple sources and it's a lot of data wrangling. It's not easy. It's not fun, but we've been using very fragmented data for the e-commerce performance from six different forces, sources, sorry, and some related to sales and shared data to measure our category performance, some related to activation and campaign performance. And another one is for the digital shelf metrics, obviously. We have limited number of retailers that provide us breakdown between delivery and in-store pickup. And I've been exploring some robust platforms where we can monitor and organize also optimize multiple campaigns on different retailer platforms at the same time and also store our data in one place in a healthy database environment but the metrics we use are coming from different format different sources in different formats and it's a challenge but i would say that the data for e-commerce is still in its infancy and i am expecting at least two more two to three more years to get it into an effective stage that makes sense. So now we laid out the funnel, talked about the journey, we look at the blueprint and we looked at how we can measure the metrics, what data attribution we can gain. And so how it's going to be reflected, how it's going to be displayed on a typical activation plan or integrated marketing plan. So this activation plan example I share here today provides a structure for a really comprehensive digital marketing plan encompassing different stages of the funnel we've talked about including paint and own media sponsored products elements like search page search activations and different sponsored product placements and you can see on the top of the slide we have four stages of the funnel different tactics and activations we have four various objectives so 
awareness, consideration, purchase, and retention. And the KPIs we track for those activations, usually we line them up on the left side of the slide. And again, depending on your platform, depending on reporting capabilities, depending on your marketing objectives, you can choose from a large pool of KPIs. I had shared some of those in the second slide, I believe in the journey slide. So you may address more than one segment of the funnel and create retargeting opportunities that helps you build more granular audiences and continuously grow your remarketing and targeting pool of customers because not each activation will only focus on one objective or the one stage of the funnel. You can have some overlaps as you can see here. One activation might cover even three different stages of the journey. And for a holistic campaign structure, we usually prefer two or three pronged approaches where we deploy more than one tactic for a targeted campaign. One of the good examples will be running your good display and search campaigns together on the same platform for better results because they enhance each other. So they continuously grow your retargeting pool. This type of monitoring and performance measurement allows us to evaluate the relative value of paid media channels and own media channels we have, different tactics for different objectives and different stages of the funnel and establish our priorities based on our marketing objectives as a part of a broader plan, integrated marketing plan, this funnel and journey together help us to identify our objectives and the channels we intend to use to reach those objectives along with an outline of specific marketing campaign and finally, how we will measure the results of those marketing campaigns. This basically trying to encompass all in one, but it's not one document, it's a living document, requires ongoing iteration. And hopefully these plat platforms and products out there will help us to get there, to have more effective measurement capabilities. All right, as you've mentioned in your slide and previously as well, reviews and feedbacks are very important from the consideration phase through purchase right. and all the way through to, to retention. Um, consumers obviously care a lot about this. They compare different options and they make purchasing decisions based off of product ratings and reviews. Amazon also considers seller ratings when determining who right. wins the buy box. How does Sabra maintain visibility of ratings and reviews across multiple websites and marketplaces? Uh, how do you act on the feedback such as how do you how do you uh, provide a feedback loop back to the product itself? So we're lucky in that regard because being a brand in a vast PepsiCo portfolio, we use a robust platform where we can monitor the reviews and the rating scores we receive on all major retailer sites. So we're able to identify opportunities to engage with our customers through their feedback and drill into the struggling products with negative reviews or bad performance. So our customer support team engage with our shoppers to make sure it's a pleasant shopping experience for them. And the continuous omni-channel execution we deliver for them is a good one or nice one. So they will come back for more. So this is also an essential tactic for customer retention and turning our customers to loyal customers and brand advocates push them through the funnel where we can increase their contribution to the brand position. And as you pointed out also, Tom, ratings and reviews are one of the six determining factors of product detail page algorithm that feeds Amazon Flywheel alongside with other technical details. So we're paying utmost attention to ratings and review. We're constantly using some sampling opportunities in different retailers, using some digital platforms to get better rating scores and increase the number of reviews we have. Got it. So on the next slide, there is a very familiar example of an activation calendar, or you can call it a marketing plan. And I close a loop on the integrated marketing plan we're talking about, even though we didn't cover the whole integrated marketing plan, I think we covered a pretty good, decent size of it. This is a very typical calendar view of the marketing plan or activation calendar, the way I'd like to call it. So far, we've evaluated the relative value of the different media channels and establish priorities based on our marketing objectives and then we've determined the appropriate resourcing and the budget allocations across selected channels and identified metrics we will use to measure the performance of our marketing campaigns and we've used customer funnel 
and customer journey to develop and prepare for implementation of a comprehensive digital marketing plan. So this type of calendar on the slide would be the commonly used marketing plan between the sales and marketing teams to execute that overall integrated marketing plan. I'm sure it might change from brand to brand, product to product, but this is the way I frequently use nowadays and share with our marketing teams. And we're working on tying this to our performance measurement tools as a part of our reporting capability. And with that, I think that's oh, the end of my slides. If you have any questions, Tom. I, I do have one, one question here. Yeah. How, how does Sabra plan for the merchandising calendar and how has that changed over the past few years? Are there things that you can share with the audience here, uh, best practices? Right. Yeah, we have more tools and tactics in our arsenal compared to three and four years ago. So that's meaning we have more lines on this calendar. We have more rows where we can deploy more ad dollars and target different segments of the journey. And we also have more buckets, again, again to allocate our marketing dollars because of these new tech uh, tools we have in the arsenal. Those relatively new tools and tactics provide more advanced segmenting and targeting capabilities with much more granular reporting and effective measurement too. We didn't have visibility to some of the metrics we have today, let's say in 2016. We built a holistic shopper journey and performance measurement report ourselves. And we can report on the performance of different activations at different stages of the funnel we've discussed on the previous slides. Therefore, we can optimize our campaigns more efficiently and shift the dollars from one activation to the other, from one channel to the other, where we see the better ROI. And this helps us, again, not only for planning the next year's budget allocations, this helps us also optimize the ongoing campaigns in flight from quarter to quarter or the back half of the year. But definitely with the development of Nielsen platform and products, we have more tools and tactics, we have more reporting capabilities, and we're spending our marketing dollars much more effectively. Gotcha. Thank you, Mert. And also, thank you so much for, for sharing your expertise with us and your experience. Super helpful. I've learned a ton uh, during this webinar. At this point, what I want to do is we, we have about 10 minutes left, and I do want to take the opportunity to answer any questions that folks might have uh, in, in the audience. Uh, I think you can, you, can, you can type in your questions, and that would be relayed to Mert and myself. So at this point, I'm gonna open it up to, uh, to Q&A. Awesome, yeah, great job. This was really helpful. And your shopper journey stages actually line up perfectly with uh, the CMA released a new omni-channel shopper framework in January, and we had the same four stages in there. So um, awesome. we didn't even plan that, but uh, yeah, I'm glad there was some similarity there. <laughs> I'd appreciate it if you can send me a copy so I would learn a little more. Yeah, 100%. Um, Thank you. All right. So, yeah, um, as Tom said, anyone in the audience, if you have any questions that came up um, throughout the presentation, go ahead and enter those now in the chat box and I will um, relay those to Tom and Mert. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first one, um, you talked about segmenting shoppers into each journey stage to determine kind of where there's maybe holes or leakage. So what data sources do you use to do that work um, and how do you account for any brick and mortar behavior? Right. For me, Jackie? Yeah, well, okay. either one, but yeah, I'm assuming, Mart, since you were talking about, you know, okay. sometimes you can find leakage opportunity and stuff like that. I'll, I'll take a quick shot and I'll leave it to Tom if she wants to add any feedback. We use, we use, as I mentioned, we use multiple data reporting from our existing platforms. And it's a challenging task because it's not as easy to get your Google Analytics report on the website traffic and where you see those leakages. So it's a manual work, data wrangling work, at least on my team. But I know there are robust platforms out there which gives you more holistic reporting capabilities as long as there are some API connections available between the right. company, ERP and CRM systems with the platforms they deploy those campaigns. But for my position right now, we're using a couple of platforms where we run those campaigns, whether it's product placement, sponsor search, or DSP. And one big example would be we're relying on 
Amazon DSPN advertising platform reporting capabilities to get those reports. And then we okay. tie it into our manually built performance measurement report I mentioned at the last slide, I believe, because mm -hmm. building a journal reporting is not an easy task and there is no product out there doing it from start to end, as far as I know. If there is, I'd like to get a demo call on that product. <laughs> so <laughs> this is how we do it. We're combining multiple reports from different platforms, whether in our campaigns, and we're tying it to our objectives and the KPIs we're tracking at this that point. Makes sense. And at least, I mean, I feel like the reporting, at least in things like awareness stage and some of the earlier ones, is actually doable in the e-com, you know, online environment versus probably brick and mortar outside of it. I don't see how you'd be measuring that at all. So unless you had a customer panel, right, maybe, and then you extrapolate it from there. So. Exactly. We use some agency reports to your point for brick and mortar sales lift or Benny brand lift studies. And okay. we're trying to combine them to an accurate granular data reports for the e-commerce platforms we run. And it's a art mixed with data to Tom's earlier point. Sure, totally. Yep, totally. All right, um, next one is for Tom. Um, so what data and, and tools does Wiser exactly offer? Do you offer metrics to assess omnichannel success or just e-commerce specifically? That's a very good question. So. At Wiser, our solution really spans across online and in store, um, and we have different off, uh, different product offerings for for different needs. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, pricing as being a very key part of what we do here. Uh, brand compliance is is another part. Um, we also focus a lot on actionability, helping brands and retailers make the right decision based off of the data that we collect. Uh, so. Definitely brick and mortar and uh, and and online. That's great, awesome. Okay, um, next one is for Mert. How has your brick and mortar marketing strategy changed as e-commerce has grown? Are you doing the same level of things like end cap sampling, in-store merchandising, for example? No, we shift our shopper marketing and in-store marketing activities significantly to digital domain, and. Okay. The share of the coupons, in-store signages or sampling demos is not at the same level like two years ago because we want traceability, granular reporting, and also customer prefers that too. The customer wants to be able to find those little digital touch points where they can complete the purchase in different environments. And omnichannel experience is growing and growing for shoppers as well as brands and retailers. So the answer is, and we're not doing it same level of activities in store like we do it in two years ago. Makes sense. Makes sense. Correlates with the sales penetration, probably, right? Exactly. exactly. Um, yeah. Great. Um, how about maybe speak to, if you can, um, what the impact of private label has been, um, you know, as more sales have moved online or in the online environment, maybe in your categories compared to just brick and mortar? Yeah, private label is always a good challenge to have. And the more retailers are investing in their private labels, it will be always a new up and coming category or competitor we're going to keep an eye on. But sure. as long as we have reporting capabilities and we see what the private label pricing is, what the changes are implementing, what new assortment or SKUs they've been launching, and we can gauge the impact on the category as well as our own sales performance, we're prepared proactively. So. The retailers are also capitalizing on this with the e-commerce growth. Obviously, the online grocery penetration is growing much faster than anticipated four years ago. So they will be investing in their private label. This is my fork. I mean, it's not a big call out moment, but I expect retailers investing more in their private labels. So it will be a question of, again, quality of product as usual and as always, and also the access to the product, convenience of shopping the product with a nice shopping experience. So brands have a little bit advantage on that because they have a better communication with the shopper. Retailers, mm -hmm. I believe, have still some way to go to build this omni-channel loyalty and experience with their re consumers. But it will yep. be a nice challenge going forward. We're looking forward to that. <laughs> Once they up their game, right? Exactly. <laughs> great that's great all right i think this one can actually be maybe to both of you if if wiser has a solution for it or maybe just how Mert's thinking about it but um have you found an effective way to measure incrementality of sales growth versus just changes in shopper behavior right so just consumers switching from brick and mortar to online or what level of incrementality have you been able to measure 
Mert, do you want do you want to go first and then I'll and then I'll follow? Sure, sure. Yes, this is another topic, very very hot topic actually between our delivery partners and us incrementality of the sales happening at the delivery platforms like Instacart and Shipt, for example. Are we moving shoppers from one brick and mortar to a delivery platform? Are we really generating incremental sales? And the answer to the question, we can track incrementality up to a certain degree, not 100%. And all the indicators we have so far shows that there is incremental growth in e-commerce shopping behavior as well as shift movement. So the as I mentioned, data is fragmented and not even the market leader data providers are at their best yet for providing e-commerce retail data. Their panels are still in developing and they don't have enough POS data. But the short answer, yes, decent portion of this sales growth is incremental, but we don't know the exact breakdown yet with granularity. Right. And I would also add to that that when, when, I, when, I, when I speak with industry experts, when I talk to my customers, I think, I think what we're seeing right now is a growing of their overall pie. I don't think it's a, a zero sum game. I don't think the, 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 the growth in e-commerce and online necessarily mean that brick and mortar businesses are going down. I think shopping online has made things easier and it has been growing. But at the same time, when we, when we look at the market, I think both brick and mortar retailing and also, and also e-commerce they both have been growing uh, over the past couple of years. It's just online has been growing even faster than brick and mortar. So the, the overall pie is just expanding. Sure. I mean, particularly over the past year, I know obviously in food, I mean, as people shifted to, you know, at home consumption, I'm sure that both brick and mortar and e-com grew. Yeah, at least in that scenario. So great. Well, that is all the questions that came in um, and we're just about right on time actually. So we planned that one well. Um, any final sort of comments from the two of you before we sign off and send everyone off on their weekend? Uh, for me, I just wanna say thank you so much again, Jackie. Thank you so much again, uh, CMA for having us. This is super fun for me. I learned a lot from Mert and um, yeah, Wiser, we, we really value uh, our partnership. Really appreciate it. Same here, I appreciate for having us here, CMA, Jackie, and all Wiser team too. And again, it's always great experience to learn from one of the technology leaders or really, really leading products in the industry. So Wiser, I know very, very good people there and great capabilities of the platform. And also I'm looking forward to that omni-channel report you just released to see what we can, what I can learn from those experts' opinions. For sure, awesome. All right, well, uh, for everyone still on, we will send the recording out from today's webinar um, early next week and post in our resource library. Uh, if you have any other questions for the CMA, feel free to reply directly to that email and we'll get them over to Tom and Mertz. And with that, um, I'm gonna sign off and close the webinar. Have a great weekend, everybody. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.